Good morning. I invite you to uh, open a Bible to the book of Matthew, chapter 7. We are going to start in verse 15. Matthew 7 is part of the most important teaching that Jesus ever gave, the Sermon on the Mount that we've been doing all through this year. And this sermon is basically Jesus' answer to the question of how we can be truly and fully and radically human. How can we be what we were meant to be? And his answer in a nutshell is that uh, we are fully human when, when we are called past this uh, external only righteousness to having a heart that loves God as well. That, that I don't just act in ways that uh, are honoring God or act in ways that show love to my neighbor, but that I would have a heart that truly loves God and loves my neighbor. And so all through 2020, we've been coming back to this teaching and uh, we go through a section for a few weeks and then we come back and take, uh, we'll, we'll take a break and then we do a few more weeks and then we come back and next week we are going to finish the whole thing. Next week is the last section. Uh, and so we're, we're going to do verses 15 through 23 today. Uh, and before we can get to that last section, Jesus has to give us this warning. So here's what he says in verse 15. Of course, of course, it's not going to work from up here. I need to figure out what's going on with this, but I can't figure it out unless you all have your cell phones interrupting the signal. Do you mind? All right, verse 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. So I'm confident that when you woke up this morning, you were just aching for a teaching on how to identify false prophets. I'm sure that's what you were hoping we were going to talk about this morning. So you might be tempted to read this verse and think, okay, False prophets, got it. Don't, don't read Joel Osteen, stay away from Joyce Meyer, got it. Uh, and then you just kind of tune out and don't pay attention. Or maybe you fill in with whatever names you think are false teachers. Okay, get it, I get it. Just don't, don't read them and I'll be fine. But listen, I want you to pay attention to this, and here's why. This passage could not have come at a better time for us. This whole section that we're going to look at is all about how to identify and evaluate church leaders. And you guys know that our time here is limited and the time is fast approaching when you will need to identify and evaluate church leaders. And I did not intend for this and the, the message on Kings to line up this morning from the Sunday school. But anyway, uh, that's how it is. So here's his warning for us. There will be people in the church, there will be leaders in the church who are not what they seem. Not every leader, not every preacher, not every elder, not every deacon, but there will be people in the church in positions of influence who are not what they appear to be. Because externally, they look like sheep. Uh, they, they look like the flock. They look like good, pious, devout, orthodox people. They look like the church ought to look on the outside. But inwardly, in their inner life, in the unseen parts of their character, there are actually wolves, ravenous wolves, who will, if they're permitted to abide, they will destroy the flock. They, these people are what Jesus would call hypocrites, people who say and do the right thing on the outside, but whose hearts and minds and secret selves are actually far from God because they are still angry and proud and greedy and anxious and impure and stingy and hateful. And so if people who do the right things on the outside but who do not love God on the inside, if they are permitted to abide, particularly in positions of leadership, they will destroy a congregation from the inside out. And so this raises an important question. How do we identify the wolves? How do we know who the wolves are? Because you can't tell just by looking at them. You can't tell just by looking at their behavior. You look at their behavior, they look like sheep. So how do I know who the wolves are? And that's what this whole section is designed to answer. So I'm just, I'm just going to read verses 15 through 23, read the whole thing, and then we'll think about it. 
He says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So after uh, warning us that there are going to be these wolves in sheep's clothing, he then changes metaphor altogether. And he starts comparing people not to uh, to wolves, but to trees, which trees are a common image for leaders in the Bible. So I want to show you a picture. Uh, a couple of years ago, Katie and I were away for Thanksgiving. And while we were away, the tree trimming people came to clear the branches away from power lines. And uh, so they had to start working on a tree. And when they cut away the branch of this tree, they found that it was rotten on the inside. And so they decided to take not just you know, this little branch, they had to go all the way to the bow of the tree. And, uh, and then they found it was still rotten. And the more that they cut, the more they found rot. And so when we came home, this is what our beloved tree looked like. And there was just a pile of wood that I then had to split and throw into the fire. We had no idea that this tree was dying on the inside. This is a tree that our kids had their rope swing on. We took pictures in front of this tree like this is a good tree. It's not a fruit tree, but it's the closest I can get to uh, the analogy. How do you know if a tree is rotten or diseased? Well, you could do like this. You know, you can break off a branch and then you find out if the inside is rotten or not. But the thing is, if you are uh, an orchard keeper, if you're an apple grower, if you're someone who raises fruit, right, you, uh, you don't want to break off a branch to test if the tree is bad. Because if you do that and it's a good branch, you've just lost fruit growing potential. So how do you know without breaking the, the, the tree down? Well, you look at the fruit, right? If the fruit is rotten, then you have a bad tree. And you don't just take off that branch. You want to cut down the whole tree before whatever that fungus is sort of infects the rest of your orchard because then you're going to be in big trouble. So how do you know if a church leader or if a potential church leader is a wolf in sheep's clothing? How do we identify the wolves? Well, you've got to look at the fruit. Well, Jesus, that sounds good. But what is the fruit? What is it that we're supposed to look at in this person? Because it's not immediately clear from the passage. He never comes out and says, and the fruit is blank. He doesn't say that. And so we kind of we have to think about it. But I do think there are a few things that we can rule out. So first of all, the fruit is not the fruit of doctrine. It's not their confession of faith. Now, why do I say this? It's because there will be people who stand in front of Jesus and say, Lord, Lord, but they are not his. There will be people who have the confession of faith down. There will be people who know their Bibles. There will be people who know all the right answers to the doctrinal exam. But on the inside, they're still a ravenous wolf. And so you can't just ask, does this person acknowledge Jesus as Lord? It's not enough just to ask, do they believe right? Now, when you're trying to identify and evaluate a church leader, is it important that they believe right? This means yes, this means no. Okay, is it important that they believe right? Okay, you can't just mouth it, okay, because uh, I can't see. So, it's not their doctrine. Now, as important as doctrine is, you can't just administer a doctrinal exam and then know if this person is going to be a good fit for the church. Here's another thing the fruit is not. It's not their behavior. It's not their actions or their lifestyle. 
How do I know if this person is a wolf in sheep's clothing? You look at the fruit of their life, but their fruit is not their behavior. Because when these false prophets stand up in front of Jesus on Judgment Day, and they say, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? And didn't we do many mighty works in your name? And we prophesied in your name. Look at all of the things that we did. And yet he still says, I never knew you. So they may even have all the right behavior. They may have the externals in place, but they don't have a heart that knows and loves Jesus. And so here's the point. If you want to know who the wolves are, you can't just look at their behavior any more than you can just look at their confession of faith or their doctrine. Righteous behavior is not a sufficient indicator of godly leadership. Is behavior important? Of course it is. If they like kill people for fun, don't, don't hire them. Like it's not, that's not good. But it's not enough. It's not enough. So what is the fruit that we're supposed to look at in order to know if a church leader or a potential church leader is legitimate and worthy of our trust? As you guys go to look at potential candidates, what should you be looking for? Well, it's not their doctrine. Doctrine's important. But just because someone says, Lord, Lord, doesn't mean that they are what you're looking for. It's not enough. It's not their behavior. That's not enough. So what should you look for? Jesus never actually comes out and tells us. He never gives us a really clear answer. But he does give us a clue in verse 23. Look at what he says. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. False prophets, they know the right answers. They understand the story. They do good deeds. And externally, they're righteous. But they do not know Jesus. And Jesus does not know them. And so as far as I can tell, looking at the fruit of a person's life is asking, does this person know Jesus? And that's different than asking if they know who Jesus is. It's different than asking if they act like Jesus. It's about asking, do they know him in their inner life? And that, unfortunately, is just really subjective. It, it's about discernment. It's a judgment call. It's not something that's super objective and clean and easy. It takes uh, discretion. Knowing Jesus and being known by him is not made apparent just through a confession of faith or just through their behavior. It's made apparent through something that is far more subtle and more personal and more organic than that. It's made apparent by something that Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, he says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If this person knows Jesus, it's going to show up as love and joy and peace and patience and so on. And so here's the deal. You can know who Jesus is and be a master of biblical trivia, but just be a sourpuss and stir up conflict, conflict and be stingy. You can tithe and fast and pray and help little old ladies across the street and still be impatient and a curmudgeon. And so if I'm looking at a potential church leader and I want to know, is this person a disciple or are they a wolf in sheep's clothing? Then I need to know, do they love well? Are they joyful? Are they at peace? Are they patient? Are they kind and generous and strong in their faith? Are they gentle? Are they disciplined? Because that's the fruit that tells you if a tree is good. Or to put it in terms from the Sermon on the Mount, it means asking does this person love their enemies or do they make fun of their enemies? Does this person have the peace that passes understanding? Is this person pure of heart? Uh, is this person, do they telegraph their spirituality? Are they given to anger? Do they own their mistakes? Or do they look for somewhere to shift the blame? Are they violent? Are they violent in their heart? 
Do they trust God or do they trust money? In short, it means asking, is this a person of the Sermon on the Mount? Is this a person who has been shaped by the character and the spirit of Jesus? The most important thing in selecting and recognizing church leaders is not going to be their education. And it's not going to be their clean noses. And it's not going to be their experience in ministry. The most important thing is going to be, do they know Jesus in their heart of hearts? And of course, it's not always easy to gauge that in just a couple of interviews or in a weekend visit. But I would submit that as a community filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll be able to gauge it with some degree of accuracy. You'll be able to tell. And of course, no leader is perfect. I look at this and I can identify the ones where I need to grow. And so I think it's important that we show grace and that we not set the bar so high that nobody would be able uh, to realistically fit the bill. But this is still the kind of thing that I think we need to be looking for first. And here's why this is so important. Knowing Jesus is the most important thing in evaluating a church leader because it is the most important thing that we want to see in ourselves. And if they, they cannot lead where they have not gone, if they don't know Jesus, they're not going to be able to lead you to Jesus. And so uh, we, we want people who have been transformed by his spirit and bear the fruit of his spirit because this is the kind of stuff we want to see in our own hearts, in our own lives. Uh, we want to be genuine. We want to have hearts that love God and love our neighbor. And so when I think about what the Apostle Paul says about the function of leaders, why the church has leaders, look at what he says in Ephesians 4. He says, He gave the apostles and the prophets, the evangelists and the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Why does Jesus give leaders to the church? It is to equip and to help us mature and to know Jesus until we all attain the maturity and the stature of the fullness of Christ. We want leaders who have been shaped by Jesus into the image of Jesus because we know that we need to be shaped into the image of Jesus. And yet, I would submit that being shaped into the image of Jesus is actually not our ultimate goal. Being shaped to look like Jesus in our inner lives and in our behavior is not our ultimate goal. The ultimate goal for me is not that I would be a person of virtue or a person of character or even that I would be wholeheartedly obedient. The ultimate goal for me is that I would know Jesus and be known by him. And actually, I believe that that is Jesus' goal also, to know Parker and to be known by Parker. And, you know, substitute your own name. So what is, uh, what's stopping that in your own life right now? What has gotten in the way lately of you knowing Jesus more deeply, more passionately, and more fully? If you're thinking, man, I just don't even know where to start. I'll give you a good place to start. Pick up one of the Gospels. Pick up Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Maybe Mark. Mark's the shortest. And it's the fastest. And just read it. Read it slowly. You don't have to cram it all into one sitting. You don't need to set a goal to like finish it by the end of the month or whatever. Just read a portion and think about it. And just dwell in that passage for a while. And then come back the next day and read the next section. And however long it takes is however long it takes. This is a great way to get to know Jesus, is to actually just spend time thinking about him. Or maybe there is a, a habit that you, need to be form, that you need to form. That you want to be more disciplined about prayer. Or you want to be more disciplined about uh, silence or fasting. Or you're going to set up some kind of schedule for doing that. You want to know Jesus more, but that means, that's going to mean spending more time in his presence. So get out your calendar or your date book or whatever it is that you use and put Jesus in there. Time for prayer, time for reading scripture. Uh, maybe there is a sin that has kept you from 
Jesus. And I'm not talking about sin in general in the sense, you know, sin separates us from God, but it's always this kind of vague general sin. Uh, Maybe there is a particular pattern in your life that has disrupted your unity with God. Because you've been too ashamed to admit it, or because you've been too busy to acknowledge it, or because you love your sin and you just don't want to confess it because you know that confessing it is going to mean having to deal with it. If you are a follower of Jesus and you recognize that there's been something in your life that has prevented you from growing in your intimacy with Jesus, then pray about it. Be honest about it. There's no sense in not being honest in prayer. Be honest about your love for your sin or about your shame over your sin or about your ignorance to whatever it is and just being open to, what, to hearing what God has to say. And let that prayer be the beginning of this journey toward knowing Jesus more fully. On the other hand, if you have not given your life to Jesus and you have not received him in baptism, but you do recognize that there's a pattern of sin in your life, then I want to invite you to take this initial step of surrender by submitting to him in baptism to receive his grace, his, uh, not merely his pardon, but his power to be a new creation. I would invite you to come and talk to me or to talk to, with one of our elders. Let me close this with prayer. Father, I know that you you love this church and you know how deeply I love this church. And for as much as, uh, as I feel I've put into it, I know that Jesus, you have you've given far more for this congregation. You've bought it at the price of your own blood. And Lord, as we, uh, as we look on to this next era, and start thinking about what it is we're looking for. I pray that you would put yourself at the top of the list. I pray that we would seek you and seek you in our leaders. I pray for our elders, for Steve and for Jim and for Jerry. I pray that you will continue to cultivate your character in these men and that you will you'll help them to recognize the spirit of Jesus in those who will be coming along. Our Lord, we love you. We pray for your wisdom to be on us, your discernment to be on us. We pray for your blessing and for your grace. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I love you guys.